Ciao everybody! My name is Valentina, Valentina Falconi. I am a Roman from seven generations and uh, I am a guide, a tour guide. I'm doing this job for 20 years and I work for Walks Inside Rome. My job is not just uh, uh, a job, a, a professional activity, it's my life. It's uh, uh, the beauty of sharing this amazing city uh, with lovely people like you are. So come back soon, we wait for you. And uh, I'm here just to start guiding you in this place. That it's one of my favorites. This is the park of the aqueducts. This is where I was born. This is where I live and this is where I really love taking people because uh, you feel on your skin what the Romans did. That is this perfect mix of uh, respecting nature, using human uh, ingenuity and uh, shaping it in this wonderful form of art. The three words I just mentioned, art, nature and uh, human ingenuity gave origin to the word techne that comes from ancient Greek but means uh, uh, technology is actually the beginning of the word technology so in our walk we will also uh, see where everything started in terms of words let's start with uh, aqueduct aqueduct comes from two words aqua and dotto condotto aqua Stays for sent for water and dotto from uh, conduits. Conduits uh, is actually a word that means uh, to lead, to take something, someone, somewhere else. Even uh, the generals had this capacity of leading their leadership. Well, the aqueduct should do it physically. So, water running through it on the top was. Uh, brought into town. So the second word means to go, to lead. Aqueducts brought water from outside sources, usually uh, settled in the mountains that you see roughly far away from here. They make like a circle around Rome. The main sources were to the east of the town and then the aqueducts moved circular this way underground, underneath, emerged a little far from here, like a mile, where the territory, the ground, uh, created a natural valley. So, so fa to face the discontinuity of the ground, they brought water to the same level, making this arches. Aqueducts served uh, to supply uh, water to the public buildings like the bath for example like um, farms gardens the several fountains of the ancient town and uh, uh, also for activity like mining and uh, building they needed a lot of water water ran on top of it and it moved just uh, thanks to gravity gravity alone it ran inside the conduit that you see there in a broken piece. It was big enough to fit a man that was the one that had to take care of the maintenance of the conduit to make sure it was cleaned, there was no molds in it, so that the water could be pure and regularly used in the city. Of course, also for drinking. So here we are along the Via Latina. This is actually the first street paved by the Romans. It is known wherever in the world that the first street ever paved by, paved by the Romans was Appian Way. Well, we have the date, 312 BC, but this existed for about 50 years before that that was made. It connected Rome and it started from about the Colosseum area to the hills you see over there, far away. Those hills are called Castelli Romani, Roman castles, because in the Renaissance, many important families had over there 
beautiful residential uh, houses actually were kind of castles and the most important one is the one belonging the Pope the summer residence of the Popes is in fact over there in uh, Castel Gandolfo so the street connected Rome to the southeast area that was very rich in uh, uh, water sources, springs, and in fact some of the aqueducts started over there. Next, from here, we will walk exploring other sections of the park and no more no less in that direction we will see an artificial lake generated by pieces of the broken aqueduct. And this is another of the aqueducts uh, of this beautiful park. This is called Aqua Marcia. As we already say, aqua means water. Marcia is referred to the name of the council that promoted the construction of the aqueduct. It takes uh, uh, a length of 91 kilometers and it emerges out of the ground at the height of the trees you see there. Those are pine trees that typically are called umbrella pines because they shape like an umbrella to offer shade naturally uh, around. But their scientific name is maritime pine and they are spread out in all the coasts of the Medi Mediterranean countries. Going back to the aqueduct, Aqua Marcia led to Rome a quantity of water that is incredible but I'm serious 190 million liter of water arrived every day into town water was taken from the springs of far away in the mountains and it was very important the spring was high elevated the respect the ground so it could run for a huge part underneath in the mountains and emerging right here. This little section you see is the result of a breaking that happened in the Middle Ages and generated in the time a sort of a natural pond and a channel that nowadays we furnish the entire park. So there's a lot of vegetation, there are lots of public gardens in which local people uh, has uh, cultivation, private cultivations of uh, vegetables uh, like tomatoes and fruit. Uh, along the way, later we will see many uh, trees uh, of fruits. See, and there are common people taking care of this. Water, as it was 2,000 years ago and more, is absolutely pure. In which way the Romans could make sure water was pure? Well, they had kind of quality tests using animals. Animals were moved by the spring. They drank the water. If, uh, for example, cows, if they produced a very uh, flavored, good tasting milk, it meant the water was, was good. Of course, uh, another feature of water is uh, to be the transparency and you can see how transparent it is and the temperature was usually very very cold like this is about 5 degrees Celsius degrees so it's almost freezing and uh, when this water arrived into private building private houses uh, sometimes they could be uh, warmed up by the existence of furnace and steam chamber and they had a connection with uh, clay pipes kind of uh, central heating we have today so actually the Romans invented all the technology we still use today this is one of the arches of uh, the aqua marcia this aqueduct was built in the year 144 BC and it is the first aqueduct that led water to the elevated parts of Rome. It supplied the areas of the Roman Forum and the Capitol Hill. So many public buildings but also many many private ones. In which way private buildings could get current water? 
simple. They had uh, a connection of smaller pipes made in lead. And this is probably why Roman people were a little peculiar, a little mad. They got them poisoned. They knew the bad effect that lead had on people, but not so deeply, not so much to prevent kind of intoxication. The aqueducts running in this part are seven. Seven are the hills of Rome. Seven are the main divinities that were adored in the Roman times. So you can easily tell that seven is a sacred number for the Romans. You know, a curiosity, for example, adoring the, men, the seven divinities and connecting them to the planets, Romans originated even the names of the days of the week. For example, Monday is the day that refers to the moon that was associated to the divinity Diana. Or Sunday, it's easy, the sun, so God Apollo. And so Friday, Friday can be complicated in English, but if you translate that in Italian, venerdì, it's easy to understand. It comes from Venus, from the divinity of beauty and love. On the other side of which we are walking, you see emerging the highest part of the Aqua Claudia. Over there, arches are about 30 meters high because uh, this is the area in which the ground uh, makes a very deep valley. And so to maintain the um, gravity always regular just angled on two degrees they have to make enormous arches to fulfill the space you have to figure the channel the conduit running at the top of the aqueduct works very similar to a straw so several straws one after the other connected by one unique wave, taking millions, millions of liters of water into the city. Right ahead, you see the little channel that we mentioned before. And around here, there are several uh, little gardens and fruit trees the local people takes care of. So you see, here now I am inside the conduit. It, it seems to be tiny and narrow, but actually this was perfect for the size of ancient Roman people. Roman people were tiny, tiny people. Even the soldiers that we figure, huge giants, were actually tiny small people and we know because we found so many uh, of the equipment they used uh, the armors the helmets and today they could fit a boy of 11 12 years old at most by the way this was the interior part of the conduit the stones are made of tufa block so uh, volcanic compressed ash and it was all covered by a kind of paste made by other a mix a mix of um, volcanic ashes little stones they had a, a special property to be waterproof so this was perfect and the fact that people could fit in here is very important because there were about 700 people every day controlling and working for the maintenance of the aqueduct to make sure there were no molds on these walls there were no dirt so this was continuously uh, cured there were openings on top so they could check and turn like well and uh, give a look if everything could work uh, perfectly <laughs> ahead you will see the continuation of the aqueduct and a kind of different conduit it's round it's a pipe that is modern in fact, it is only 1585.
Let's go and see the Aquedotto Felice. Usually aqueducts didn't run on a straight way, but they made kind of S shapes. And you can see Aqua Marcia making a sort of U-turn and crossing the higher, the highest arches over there that are the ones of Aqua Claudia. The uh, Aqua Marcia continues making another turn on the opposite sense on the, on the right. At the point of the tower you see there, actually there's uh, the intersection of the aqueducts. Now in the Middle Ages, uh, so we're talking about uh, uh, the 500 AD, 530s, uh, when the Roman Empire had already collapsed, uh, Rome had no longer protection. The emperors had moved far away from Rome. The Emperor Constantine had created a new capital named after himself, now very modest, Constantinople, that nowadays corresponds to Istanbul. So actually Rome had no longer protection and it started to be invaded by several barbarian tribes. With the name barbarians, we indicate all the tribes that came from far away, could be north, could be south. They didn't shave in the accurate way the Romans used to shave. And so this was considered a little sign of uh, not civilization and so barba gave the name of barbarians barba stands for beer anyway a barbarian tribe the goat occupied the intersection of the aqueducts so actually they used the arches of the two aqueducts as a, a military camp a fortification a fort they broke the aqueduct and you see the damages they made time cannot do this but in case of war you know man has uh, uh, brilliant ideas to put on knees the enemies and the best fast way to uh, destroy Rome was uh, no let Rome to have uh, water and uh, the refurnishment that came through the Appian Way they ran just across the aqueducts so in this way the barbarians had the total control of the south part of the city they stood a couple of years into that area that still today takes that name it is called Campo Barbarico the barbarian field the barbarian camp the tower instead it's very modern it is only 1000 years old <laughs> that in here you know means to be modern and it was the tower built uh, by uh, uh, the men in charge to make people pay taxes when entering in Rome. Of course, those taxes entered the pockets of the popes, because at that time, Rome was controlled by papacy. Maybe someone of you recognizes this beautiful view uh, in the movie La Grande Bellezza, The Great Beauty. If I'm not wrong, it won an Oscar for foreign language. Anyway, there are the two main characters walking uh, at the shade of these wonderful aqueducts. We, in this way, like we're doing now. Let's go and see the rest of the park. The secret of the aqueducts consists in the arch. The arch was invented by the Etruscan people. Etruscans were the population that lived in central Italy, so actually all the regions that then were taken by the Romans. And uh, uh, they left many, many great stuff, many inventions that the Romans exploited at their best. The arch works very similar to an umbrella. So actually all the forces that comes from the top, from the top, goes down. Uh, it is perfect.
perfectly shared into two parts. So like rain falling over the umbrella falls on your sides, the forces fall in the basement, this direction. In this part, it's very stable and secure. The secret of this strength consists in the keystone. The keystone is the largest block of stone that you see in the middle. Usually the keystone it is shaped this way with a larger surface on top and a smaller one on the basement. In this way it fits perfectly but doesn't move. So in case of earthquake you see this stays and this is the perfect place to be. The stone you see here on this surface of these arches it's tufa. Tufa is nothing but compressed volcanic ash that the Roman took out from uh, underground quarries. It was uh, very soft to be excavated and moved out of the quarries but once you get in touch with oxygen and uh, sun uh, light uh, it comes uh, this hard unbreakable. So this is the other secret of the force and the strength of the aqueduct. In this little corner of the earth seems time never passed. Everything stopped about 2000 years ago. In, uh, now we are at the end of the summer, but at the beginning of the spring, you can see a real waterfall falling here and it is magic. Consider that already in the 1800, many tourists let's call them tourists, used to come in here to relax, to enjoy the beauty, the peace, the history of uh, this area. And I'm talking about people like Goethe, for example, or even uh, the English poets Keats and Shelley and Byron. When they had some free time, they loved walking here, relaxing under the shade of these trees, this trees and uh, the fabulous artists of the Roman aqueducts. So the Campania Romana, the Roman countryside, always, always kept this magic uh, status. Only in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, the neighborhood around arose. Buildings uh, were uh, built and uh, the city enlarged. But until 1950s, you could come in here and uh, there were no modern streets, uh, no modern buildings, nothing but what you see here, nature and art. After the fall of the Roman empires, this area felt in a total abandon and uh, disused. Consider that all the aqueducts that were visible, so the beautiful arches, were broken during the Babylon invasions. The only ones that could continue working were the aqueducts that ran all their way underground. So for centuries and centuries this area was abandoned. In uh, the 1200, we don't have the exact date, uh, but approximately in uh, the half of the Middle Ages, uh, this building was erected and it was uh, a kind of uh, um, farmhouse where uh, people, especially foreigners, could stop after miles and miles of walking and find rest or, for example, could make their horses having some little rest before arriving in Rome. We are in between the fourth and the fifth mile away from the city center. When I say city center, we, I refer to the Roman Forum, to the Colosseum, to the seven hills of Rome. So here we are only four miles away from that part. And so this was the place where probably they stopped resting. The curious thing and the funny thing is that, uh, uh, like many others, other buildings of that time, 
it is a sort of puzzle made with pieces of basalt that was the stone used to pave the streets like the latina street we saw before it was made with pieces of tufa black that is the stone used for erecting the aqueducts and also travertine so my friends this is all from the park of the aqueducts i really hope you enjoyed i did we did goodbye from valentina and walks inside rome continue following us continue coming and uh, let's hope to meet back soon